when in clinic would you not order ApoB? Is there ever a scenario where LDL cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol and triglycerides tells you everything you need to know and there wouldn't be any kind of extra information that you would get from ApoB that would change your kind of clinical management of that patient? Yes, I think there are scenarios where I don't need to know somebody's ApoB. I, I, I have to think about when that is. Um, mostly, my first thought about that is that it's after I've already established that their ApoB matches their LDL cholesterol. So when it's so-called concordant with their LDL cholesterol. So if I, if I can learn that from the LDL cholesterol, uh, the current standard now is that if I want to know somebody's ApoB, I have to order that as a separate test. And every time I order a separate test for an individual, I generate a bill, right? The, the lab is going to charge that person and their proxy money to, to me- do that measurement. So someone has to pay for that. In what percentage of the population would you say ApoB correlates really well to LDL cholesterol? I think the number is around 75 to 80%. Okay. That the discordance rate is somewhere in the, and maybe I overstated that. I think it's somewhere in the one third kind of range. I think I maybe overstated that. So maybe 60 to 70% is concordant. And so discordance in that, say 25% or, or whatever it is, is when you measure their LDL cholesterol, it's uh, a certain number. You then measure ApoB, and that ApoB is dramatically lower or higher than you would have predicted? Discordance is not well-defined in the medical literature. <laughs> I think I know it when I see it, but there's a lot of different ways that you can you can describe it. When there's a major discordance, it's it's obvious, but there's also minor discordance. So the, the, the concept of concordance or versus discordance is based upon population-based tables. So in our paper, we described, uh, we looked at tables from three different data sets. The first one is the National Health and Nutrition Survey, the NHANES, and using data in untreated adults over the age of 18 between the years of 2005 to 2016, because that was the database that we had. And in untreated individuals, you can form a data table of what the range of LDL cholesterol is in that population. And it's a survey. And I, if I remember the number correctly, it was something over 12,000 individuals in that, in that data set. So the, you know, the range of LDL cholesterol, it may not, you know, you, you may not capture anybody with like rare diseases or anything, but it's meant to be representative of the society at large. And then you get a similar range of ApoB. So that data set, we had ApoB levels on all those, all those individuals as well. And you can see whose level is in the fifth percentile for ApoB and the fifth percentile for LDL cholesterol. You can see who's in the 50th percentile for both. You can see, you know, what the numbers are for the 75th percentile. And so they, you can create a table and put them next to each other and see if they line up. So we made a table using uh, deciles. And um, if somebody's in a different decile, you could, I suppose, refer to them as being discordant. So if you're in the 20th percentile for LDL cholesterol, but the 30th percentile for ApoB, you're discordant. Mildly. Yeah, but it probably doesn't matter biologically. But if you're in the 20th percentile for LDL cholesterol and the 80th percentile for ApoB, it probably does matter. So the issue is if you... I mean, I'll get you to elaborate on this. There's probably a couple different issues <laughs> that could arise in clinic. But I come in to see you. Uh, I show you my LDL cholesterol. It's, let's say it's 80 milligrams per deciliter. And you're thinking, and let's say I'm untreated. You're thinking, well, that's not too high. Um, could be lower, but it's not, it's not crazy high by any means. You don't measure my ApoB. You just assume that it's correlated Meanwhile, my AP, APOB could be 120, 130. Yeah. So they're discordant. And because APOB is what really is determining risk, not LDL cholesterol, I'm now someone who's untreated with higher risk than you thought. Exactly. That, that's, our, that's one of my greatest fears is that we have untreated patients who we're under treating 
because we think they look fine. And you know that discordance, if you don't measure ApoB, you don't even know that that's the case. You can also do this with NMR and ion mobility and look at LDL particle number. But in the, you know, I, I don't want to get too much into that because I, I know less about uh, measuring particle number than I do about ApoB. But ApoB is a w- well-validated, reproducible, inexpensive way to estimate the number of atherogenic lipoproteins. And so we have these now, now we have these population-based tables that we can really look at that and we can do what are known as discordance analyses. Definitely not my expertise in how those are done, but there's a lot of different ways that discordance analyses have been done. You can look at above the mean versus below the mean and call that discordant. But that also means that if you're in the 49th percentile for one and the 51st percentile for another, you're discordant. And that doesn't distinguish between 20th versus 80th, unless you, you know, I'm sure there's some parameters to how that's done too. But that's one way is just above versus below the mean for, for, num- for numbers. This episode is proudly brought to you by 38 Terra. Try 38 Terra's DMN prebiotic, the science-based daily multivitamin for your gut microbes, a simple and delicious way to take your gut health to the next level. Now back in stock in new and improved packaging for customers living in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Get 10% off your DMN at 38terra.com using the code THEPROOF. That's 38TERA.com and use the coupon code THEPROOF for 10% off. Does it really matter if you're discordant or not, the kind of the label, or is it just about getting LDL cholesterol and ApoB to some desirable level based on who you are. Oh yeah. Thank you for cutting right to that. Cause, <laughs> cause I took that, that's actually where I was going, which is I, none of that really matters. What I will tell you is that all the different discordance analyses that have been done have confirmed that if you're trying to predict who's has re- more residual risk on treatment, ApoB is a much better tool for doing that. Whether you're using the older Friedenwald formula for calculating LDL cholesterol or the newer Martin Hopkins or Samson NIH formula. It doesn't matter what LDL cholesterol formula you use, ApoB is still going to outperform LDL cholesterol. So that could arise for someone who's being treated with lipid lowering therapy. So it's different context. They're treated with some level of intensity. LDL cholesterol gets to goal according to the guidelines. But again, if ApoB is not measured, you might miss that there is discordance in this individual and ApoB is higher than than where we would want it. Yeah. So yeah, that scenario. So we looked at that data. Also, we used data from two large clinical trials, something called the Improve It trial, which was the you know, azetamibe study and the Fourier trial, which was uh, evolocumab, the PCSK9 monoclonal antibody study in people with stable ASCVD. And so, you know, we had a, a lot of patients in those two clinical trials and we could do, um, we, we could create uh, the, the corollary LDL cholesterol versus ApoB tables and, and show the linear relationship between those two things and the presence of discordance in treated patients. It's not the same line exactly as the line that we created in the untreated patients. The relationship between treated and untreated patients is different. Conceptually, I think what's happening, and Alan Snyderman helped talk me through this, and I think this makes sense, is that when you treat patients with the medicines that we use, all of those LDL receptor modulating therapies, statins, acetamide, PCSK9 um, therapies, you upregulate LDL receptors, you selectively remove LDL particles that are more cholesterol enriched compared to cholesterol depleted particles. So the LDL cholesterol cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol tends to go down disproportionately compared to the ApoB on treatment. So the linear relationship in treated versus untreated patients is different enough that when you look at the, the linear relationship, there are actually two different lines. And Nick Marston and one of the authors on our paper, you know, really helped us put together this with Maureen Sampson uh, from the NIH who helped us put the NHANES data together. And when you put those two data pieces together, you do see that there's a difference between them. And so the, the consequence is that when we had this, these data sets, we could have created two different types of discordance tables to look at. 
but man, this is complicated enough as it is. So what we tried to do is just converge those, those data sets of treated and untreated patients, recognize that we don't have to be precise here. We, we want to, the message needs to be, there's a possibility that you can have discordance. When there's discordance, trust the ApoB more than the LDL cholesterol. And we created some, um, some thresholds that are based upon the guideline-based LDL cholesterol thresholds by using, using this data set. And so the idea is if there is discordance, there may be this residual risk that is posed by this uh, eleva- elevated level of ApoB. Um, you treat ApoB to some sort of target level based on someone's risk and then and I believe from reading the paper this is where there's a gap in the research but the presumption now is that that treating that ApoB in that scenario would help attenuate reduce that residual risk and lower events even further that's the idea and I am I'm under no pretense that we eliminate atherosclerosis in those people and no pretense that that is going to eradicate all of the risk but it should eradicate as much of the risk due to lipid and lipoprotein levels as possible. It's 2025 and I have made the decision to join Function Health to help monitor and optimize my health. And honestly, after getting set up, I am wondering what took me so long. Function makes it extremely easy to track important biometric information over a lifetime. Information that you can use in real time to make important health decisions. Function gives you over 100 lab tests covering your entire body every year. Heart, hormones, liver, kidneys, thyroid, metabolic health, heavy metals, autoimmunity, nutrients, and more. Five times more testing than your typical physical for $499 a year. A lot cheaper than if you were to order all of these tests individually. That's if you can order them. Take ApoB and LP little a, for example, two very important tests for determining your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. Yet, as outlined in multiple episodes on this show by Dr. Thomas Dayspring, they can be incredibly difficult to order with your local doctor. Using Function is very straightforward. You join and then visit one of their 2000 US lab locations. I went to one here in LA where I live. It's very easy and boom, your results are tracked over time in one secure place. No shady upselling, no gimmicks, just your results beautifully presented and science-based insights from doctors to help you optimize your health. Skip the 400,000 person wait list today at functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill and join me on the path to nerd level health optimization. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.